Hello everybody, this is Dr Christopher White and in this presentation we're going to continue looking at igneous rocks. So this video is going to correspond to section 5.2 of your textbook. So the next thing we need to consider when we're thinking about igneous rocks is how do we classify them? How do we split them up into groups? Well, you can see in front of us that we have nine different igneous rock samples. These are all different igneous rocks. Now, one of the ways we can split them up has already been discussed. We can split them up based on the size of the crystals. So if we look at the samples, we can see we have this sample here, 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 and here, where the crystals are easily visible to the naked eye. We would therefore classify these rocks as phaneritic. In contrast, we have this sample here, 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 and here, where the majority of minerals in our sample are too small to be seen with the naked eye, and as such we would classify these rocks as aphanitic or volcanic. Now, this is a very simple method of splitting up rocks. The problem is, is that it gives you essentially just two groups, and there's a lot of variation in igneous rocks, so it means you would end up with two groups which would contain many, many different types of igneous rocks. So when it comes to splitting them up, it's not really that helpful. So let's go back and let's look at the samples. Well, another thing you'll notice about these samples is there is quite a lot of variation in colour. So we have colours ranging from essentially white to light grey, we have pinky colours, we have very dark coloured rocks, in this case dark brown, we have kind of very strongly coloured rocks, in this case a green rock, and we have some rocks that are kind of somewhere in between. So can we use the colour to help us split up the rocks? Well, yes, we can, because colour is a reflection of the minerals that make up the rock. Typically, the more iron, magnesium or calcium minerals you have in your rock, the darker your rock will be in terms of its colour, because iron, magnesium and calcium minerals are typically darker coloured. In contrast, rocks which are richer in sodium and potassium minerals will often have a lighter colour, because sodium and potassium minerals are more lightly coloured. So the question is, is, well, what's going to affect the minerals that we get? There's two controlling factors. The first one is the composition of your magma. So if your magma is very, very rich in sodium, potassium, aluminum and silicon, well, what are you going to get? You're going to get lots and lots of sodium, potassium, aluminium, silicate minerals. In contrast, if your, if your magma is quite rich in magnesium and iron and it has a little bit of silicon in it, well, what are you going to get? You're obviously going to get iron magnesium silicate minerals. So the chemistry of your magma is the first factor which is going to control what minerals you get. And then obviously the minerals you get are going to control the color of your rock. Another factor which is going to control what minerals you get is temperature. So some magmas can form at quite high temperatures and some magmas will be lower in temperature by comparison. And this is obviously also going to affect the types of minerals you get. Some minerals will prefer to be at very, very high temperatures and they will hate lower temperatures. In contrast, there are some minerals which will only form at low temperatures because they can't survive in higher temperature conditions. So this is another factor that's going to help control what minerals we have in our rock. Now, when we take this approach of using the chemistry of the rock to essentially help split our rocks up into groups, what do we end up with? Well, in that situation, we end up with a classification system that has four different types of magma. And these types of magma are termed felsic, intermediate, mafic, and ultramafic. So let's look at the colours of the rocks which are associated with these types of magmas. Now, typically, felsic, igneous, felsic magmas will typically produce an igneous rock that has a pink to light grey colour. Intermediate igneous rocks will often have a colour which ranges between light to medium grey. Mafic igneous rocks will typically have a colour that's somewhere between a dark grey to black. And ultramafic igneous rocks will tend to have a green to dark brown colour to them. Once again, this is a reflection of the minerals that make up the rock. Now, when we look at the chemistry of our samples, we can see that there is a variation in the chemistry. So felsic igneous rocks are very rich in silicon, sodium, potassium, and aluminium. And this means that what we're going to end up with are large amounts of sodium and potassium aluminium silicate minerals. It just so happens that potassium feldspar, 
which is obviously contains lots of potassium, as the name suggests, has a very distinctive pink colour to it. So it's not uncommon for felsic igneous rocks to have a slightly pink colour to them because of the presence of potassium feldspar. So if we go back to our previous slide, we can see, notice how this rock has a very distinct pink colour to it. Notice how this rock down here has these kind of uh, pinky coloured areas there, and this rock here also has pinky coloured areas. This is showing us that there is the presence of potassium feldspar in our rock. In terms of intermediate igneous rocks, we, ha we have a, a magma that contains quite a bit of silicon, some sodium, potassium, but it also has calcium in there in higher quantities, and we have aluminium as well. The presence of calcium means that the minerals that we have are going to be a little bit darker in their colour, and so this means we're going to end up with rocks that have this kind of coloration, this kind of medium grey kind of colour. In terms of mafic igneous rocks, well they're rich in calcium, magnesium, and iron. And so this is obviously going to produce a large amount of calcium, magnesium, and iron silicate minerals, which are going to have darker colors to them. And so if we go back, we can see now we don't have a rock that matches this particular uh, description perfectly, but this would be the kind of closest one we have here. We can see we have lots of these darker colored minerals, and this particular rock actually has a slightly lighter color to it because the lighter, kind of like creamy white mineral we can see here is actually a type of calcium mineral. Now, this is actually a mafic igneous rock here, but in this particular instance, I mean, it's not a particularly darkly colored one. So this doesn't really help my point. So you're just gonna have to trust me that this is actually a mafic igneous rock. In terms of ultramafic igneous rocks, the magmas that form them are very, very rich in iron and magnesium. And so obviously we're going to end up with a rock which is dominated by iron and magnesium silicate minerals. So if we go back to our previous slide here, we can see here we have an ultramafic rock down here. This one is dominated by the green mineral olivine. Olivine has a chemical composition that consists of iron, magnesium and silicon. And up here we have a type of uh, ultramafic igneous rock which is called a peroxonite. This one too is going to be dominated by uh, iron and magnesium silicate minerals. In this case, a type of mineral which we refer to as orthopyroxene. So we can see that the chemistry of the magma that forms our rock is controlling the minerals and that is then going to control the color of our rock sample. But we can also use the chemistry in another way. You'll notice that we look at the amount of silica. So that's silica, not silicon. Okay, silica is defined as SiO2. What you'll notice is that as you progress from felsic igneous rocks to ultramafic igneous rocks, you'll notice the amount of silica is going down. So there's less SiO2 in the magma. This once again is going to control the types of minerals that you get. So in the case of felsic igneous rocks, there's absolutely piles of silica. And so this means you can produce minerals which have a very, very high silica content. So something like potassium feldspar has lots of silica in it, but that's okay because there's enough silica in the magma to supply its ability to grow. In contrast, an ultramafic magma is relatively silica poor. This means that any minerals that form from it will have to you know, take that into account. And so rocks like, sorry, minerals like olivine and orthoperoxine are relatively light when it comes to silica. They don't require much silica to make. And as such, they are also going to be the preferred minerals that form when an ultramafic magma starts to crystallize. Now, the other factor we discussed was the temperature. You'll notice as we go from felsic to ultramafic, the temperature of the magma is increasing. So felsic magmas will typically have a lower temperature, 850 Celsius or lower. Intermediate magmas will have a temperature range somewhere between 850 and 1000. Mafic magmas will have a temperature range typically between 1000 and 1200. And ultramafic magmas will have a temperature range between 1200 and 1400. And so this also is going to have an effect on the minerals that we get. So minerals like olivine and orthoperoxine absolutely love higher temperatures. And so they would be perfectly happy in the conditions which are provided by an ultramafic magma. In contrast, something like potassium feldspar does not appreciate very high temperatures. So it would not like to form from an ultramafic magma if it could.
In contrast, potassium felspar prefers typically lower temperatures, and so the lower temperatures provided by a felsic magma would be perfect for the crystallization of potassium feldspar. So you're seeing how this combination of chemistry and temperature is going to affect the minerals that we get. And obviously then that's going to affect the physical properties of our rocks, most importantly, their color. And then the final thing we can see here is what's actually melting to, to essentially produce the magma that we see. So if we want to form a felsic magma, what do we have to melt? Well, the answer is continental crust. And that happens to work quite well because continental crust is naturally quite rich in silicon, sodium, potassium, and aluminium. So when you melt continental crust, you produce a magma that has a similar composition. In the case of intermediate magmas, typically what you're melting is either continental or oceanic crust, and this is going to produce a magma that has a slightly more varied composition. Um, but you're still going to get quite a lot of silica, silicon, so, sorry, silicon, sorry, uh, sodium, potassium, calcium, and aluminium. In terms of mafic and ultramafic rocks, we melt mantle rocks. So mantle rocks, as we know, are very, very rich in magnesium and iron, and they're relatively low in silicon. And silica, sorry, no, sil yeah, silica. Sorry, got myself confused there. And so, um, and so they're going to produce a magma which is going to be quite rich in magnesium, iron, and also a certain amount of calcium. And so what we can see here is the chemistry is a result of what's actually being melted to produce the magma. So you can see how everything is beginning to tie together to explain why we have this variation in color between these different types of igneous rocks. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go through the four types of igneous rock and we're going to look at two classic examples for each of these types of magma. One example will be the kind of standard plutonic rock produced by that magma and the other example will be the standard uh, volcanic or aphanitic rock produced by that magma. So when a felsic magma crystallizes, if it crystallizes slowly underground, it's going to produce a plutonic rock. And the plutonic rock that it's going to produce typically will be granite. That's the classic example. So we can see that granite consists of lots of potassium feldspar, which are these pink minerals. We can also see there's lots and lots of uh, the mineral quartz mixed in here as well, which is kind of visible as these dark gray areas here. There's a little bit of sodium plagioclase feldspar mixed in there as well, which is visible as these kind of creamy white areas. And then there are these uh, darker areas which are going to be a mineral, typically something like biotite. You'll notice that the amount of the darker minerals, the ferromagnesium minerals, is relatively low. And this, once again, is a reflection of the chemical composition of the magma. It doesn't have very much iron in it, and so you can't form many iron minerals. We can see that a similar color is maintained in rhyolite. Rhyolite is the volcanic rock which typically forms from a felsic magma. And so in this case, once again, you can see the same pink color. You can see it's got this kind of light pink color to it. This is because of the uh, potassium feldspar. We can see there are a few flecks of darker colored minerals. And the rest of the rock, so the quartz and the plagioclase feldspar, that's too fine grained for us to see. But we can see how these felsic rocks will tend to have a slightly pink color to them because of the potassium feldspar. Now, I am going to be honest, not all felsic igneous rocks are pink. It's not uncommon for them to also maybe have a very light gray or white color as well, depending on exactly how much potassium feldspar there is and whether that potassium feldspar has a dark or, or, dark or light pink color to it. So, you know, there is going to be some color variation. But anyway... Felsic igneous rocks will typically give us a granite if you're thinking about a magma cooling slowly underground or a rhyolite if the lava cools very quickly on the surface of the earth. So in terms of intermediate igneous rocks, the plutonic intermediate igneous rocks that forms from an intermediate magma is a type of rock that we call a diorite. Now diorites can be identified because they are about 50% dark minerals and 50% light colored minerals. So if we look at our rock here, we can see we have lots and lots of dark minerals. This is typically a mineral like amphibole or maybe biotite. In contrast, we have these uh, lighter creamy white colored minerals. This is typically a type of plagioclase feldspar. And so if you look at the sample, you can see here, it's about 50-50 dark minerals and 50% light minerals.
And so this is the way that we're typically going to be able to classify a diorite. It's going to be plutonic, and it's going to be about 50% dark minerals and 50% light minerals. Now, if our intermediate magma is erupted onto the surface of the Earth in the form of an intermediate lava, the rock that we're going to get will be a type of rock which we refer to as an andesite. So andesites are typically a porphyritic igneous rock, so they'll typically have phenocrysts in a finer grained ground mass. And you can see in this example here, you can see these big phenocrysts in this finer grey coloured ground mass. So porphyritic texture is very, very common with uh, andesites. And you can see in this case we have these creamy white minerals, so that's going to be plagioclase feldspar again, and we have these black flecks which is probably going to be the mineral hornblende, which is a type of amphibole. Now the rest of the rock though is very very fine grained, we can't see the crystals and so we're going to classify this particular rock as a volcanic rock. But you can see this particular rock has a very medium grey colour to it because it has a higher concentration of iron and magnesium minerals, it helps to make the colour of the rock darker. So intermediate magmas will give us a diorite if the magma cools underground slowly, and an andesite if the lava cools on the surface of the earth quickly. In terms of mafic magmas, well the type of rock we're going to get if a mafic magma cools slowly underground is a type of rock called a gabbro. So we can see in this case we have a rock that consists of these uh, brown coloured minerals here. These are probably going to be crystals of orthopyroxene and in between them we have these crystals which have this kind of deep grey colour to them. That's going to be calcium plagioclase feldspar because mafic magmas tend to be quite rich in calcium with lesser amounts of iron and magnesium. So we get lots of calcium silicate minerals and lesser iron and magnesium silicate minerals. So the calcium silicate minerals is the, is the uh, plagioclase feldspar here which is the grey colour whilst the uh, magnesium and iron minerals uh, are represented by the uh, orthopyroxene. Now if we were to let our magma erupt onto the surface of the earth and cool down quickly the type of rock we would get would be a basalt. So basalts tend to be a very dark grey to black colour, which is once again a reflection of the chemistry of the rock and the minerals that it produces. And so in the case of a basalt, just like the gabbro here, we have lots of these darker coloured calcium plagioclase feldspar minerals, and we also have um, some of these darker coloured minerals such as uh, orthopyroxene and olivine. That's also going to help the rock take on a much darker colour. So mafic magmas, if they cool slowly underground, will give us a gabbro, and if they cool quickly on the surface of the earth, will produce a basalt. The final type of magma is ultramafic, and if an ultramafic magma is allowed to cool slowly underground, it will give us a type of rock which is referred to as a peridotite. Now, peridotite is what we refer to in geology as a bucket term. So it actually contains several lesser rock types, which we all just lump together and call peridotites simply for the ease of describing what they are. But these rocks are typically dominated by the minerals olivine or orthopyroxene. So they'll typically either be green in colour or brown in colour. But once again, the coloration that we're seeing is a reflection of the minerals and that's a reflection of the chemistry of the magma. Now, if an ultramafic magma is erupted onto the surface of the earth, it will form a type of rock which is called a comartiite. Now, the thing about comartiites is, is they're not actually erupted anymore. The earth can't produce them in large enough quantities to actually get a you know, big enough volume of magma onto the surface of the earth to produce a lava flow. We do still produce ultramafic magmas in the earth, but most of them get trapped at either the base of the earth's crust or somewhere in the earth's crust as they're trying to rise through it. So comartiites no longer form, because there's simply not a large enough volume of ultramafic magma being created inside the earth anymore. So the last time we saw comartiites forming was a, was a long, long time ago, all the way back in the Precambrian. So we're talking before uh, 542 million years ago. So anywhere between about 4.4 billion and 542 million years ago. So, you know, that in, that, in the Precambrian, the interior of the earth was warm enough to produce uh, ultramafic magmas in large enough volumes that they could make it to the earth's surface. But since then, the earth's interior has cooled down. And so we're not producing ultramafic magmas in, an, in large enough quantities to mean that the magma can make it all the way to the surface and be erupted. 
So just bear that in mind. So Kamartiite is a type of rock that doesn't actually form anymore. So one more time, ultramafic magmas, if they're allowed to cool slowly underground, they will give us a type of rock which we refer to as a peridotite. If they cool quickly on the surface of the earth, they will give us a type of rock which we refer to as a kamartiite. All right, thank you for watching everybody and have a good day.